Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited about my guest today. She has been one of my most requested guests, and she's somebody I've wanted to have on the podcast for a long time. So I am absolutely so thrilled to have the one and only, like truly the fucking one and only, Adriana Chechik here today. Yes. Hi. <laughs> you look adorable as always. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my God. I love your outfit. Thank you. Um, so Adriana, I guess, God, where do we even start? I mean, you're such a big star now and um, I know you've done a ton of podcasts, mm -hmm. but I guess let's assume that someone has never seen any of your other interviews. Let's mm -hmm. just talk about the beginning. Like, Let's talk about how you grew up and then how you got into adult. Okay. Um, so I grew up in uh, in and out of foster care, uh, mainly in Pennsylvania, so East Coast. Um, and it was a pretty crazy life. I think um, I actually think everything I went through in my past was really, really set me up for porn because I learned how to say no. <laughs> That's yeah, I learned the rights and the, the wrongs. Hardest thing. Yeah, and. Um, from there, uh, when I was about 16, I emancipated myself from the state. Mm -hmm. So I had like all the privileges of an 18 year old and I worked at a restaurant for about a year. And then I went to college. I was in Drexel for, uh, bioengineering for a year, decided math was way too hard. <laughs> Tried to switch to biochem. Uh, and in the midst of being a biochem major, my girlfriend who was a stripper and I was strapped for cash was like, oh, you should come work at the strip club. So I was one night into being a cocktail waitress. And I remember seeing her get off stage with all the money that she had. And my second night, I actually went up and started stripping. And the money was so good. I was having such a fun time. It's kind of the only time I've ever like let loose since I grew up um, mainly with like strict families. Mm -hmm. um, it was like my first taste of freedom. And I was making so much. I was just like, you know, I don't think I really want to go to school anymore. Yeah. So, so I went from there and traveled around the U.S. for about. Uh, so I started point at 21. I started traveling around the U.S. at 20. So I did one full year of just travel stripping, which is amazing money. And you kind of follow like golf competitions, bikers. Um, so you make really good money. And then I ended up in Miami. I was partying a lot. And I started to get used to like sleeping all day, working all night. And for me, I figured out I'm the type of person that likes to be awake in the daylight. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think they call it seasonal depression. Mm. So I felt like I was kind of having like the seasonal depression. Um, and a gentleman came in and was like, hey, do you want to be in a movie? And I don't think I thought it was a porno. I was just like, sure, I'll be in a movie thinking he was like lying or something. And I showed up to set and it was the Bang Bros, um, I think it was Come Fiesta, right? So they just like make you get tested the morning of and mm -hmm. then they drive you to set and you're like, oh, you're doing a porno. And I remember being like, hmm, okay. And I was like, what's the worst that can happen? And I remember specifically thinking in my mind, like, I don't have family that would be upset. The half siblings I have were all really cool. And the only... Thing I could foresee in the future being an issue is if I wanted to have children, how would that affect my children? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I grew up in foster care, babysitting. It was the best birth control. So <laughs> I never want kids. So I was like, okay, <laughs> fine, let's do this. And, um, you know, the rest is history. It was, it was a crazy day. I remember I was so nervous. Uh, the director actually had to stop me and be like, are you okay? Because I was trying to take sex stills, but I was like shaking, shaking. during the sex yeah. stills. And the funniest part is it was a three-way, but what I was most nervous about wasn't being filmed. It was if I was going to eat the girl out and be good at it. So, like, I was like, oh, clearly this is for me if I'm, like, only worried about the sexual part, like, being good at sex. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was it. It was, like, all down, all uphill, uphill from there. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love the fact that, I mean, you really, like, methodically thought about this before yeah. you did it. You were like, okay, what are, like, the negatives and are they big enough that I'm not going to make this choice and do it? And you decided, like, that you could live with all of the possible, basically the stigma that you would be facing. Totally. And you were like, that's not a problem for me and I'm going to move forward. Yeah, totally. I've always really thought out my decisions. Yeah. Even if I've acted... 
even if I've acted crazy or made the wrong decisions, I've still thought them out. I knew what I was doing. I've always known what I was doing. So <laughs> yeah, you are very calculated yeah. in in your career too. I mean, obviously, like with how successful you are, you've you've definitely thought about all of the choices that you have made. Yes. Totally. So um, I just want to go back a little bit. So you grew up in foster care and you grew up with some Amish families. Yes. So what was that like? So, uh, you know, if I look back at my life, I think out of all the foster cares I ever stayed at, the Amish were some of the best times of my life. Um, so what would happen is you'd stay with the state. And then if you were bad enough during the week, they would send you to stay with Amish people because it was like this program and you could go work on the farm. And it was supposed to be like bad, like kids didn't want to do it. I would purposely get in trouble midweek towards the end of the week so I could go hang out on the Amish farms because you're outside, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's a lot different of a community than what people think it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's very tight knit. Uh, so you really do get to hang out with everyone and talk to everyone. The only difference is there's like a little bit of uh, segregation between the male and the female. Mm -hmm. um, but the coolest thing was like we got to play badminton and I always joke like I can carry like a ridiculous amount of bales of hay, which are really heavy, but I'm like really good at it. Um, so I really enjoyed it. I mean, some of some of my best memories are like shucking corn, snapping peas and I really learned a lot of good habits that kind of set me up for the rest of my life. Um, like time management there is really good. Structure, cleanliness, uh, making your bed. Like I always make my bed, tuck your corners in. Um, and ironically, out of all the foster cares I would stay in, uh, Amish people have the best hygiene. Hmm. So they really taught me hygiene because no one else was teaching me how to do my hair, brush my hair, properly brush my teeth, clean myself because they just – here's a shower, here's a bath, here's the supplies, do it. Right. Um, but I think there's a lot of care when you're in that tight knit of a family uh, setting. Mm -hmm. So they really care for you and they teach you like, okay, this is the proper way to do your hair and all that stuff. So I learned a lot of really good tools. Um, I will say being punished on, on an Amish farm, if you're bad there, is really funny because it's just doing like a lot of legwork and um, picking up poop like horse poop, cow poop, like just shoveling poop. Like that's their punishment. They're like, really? all right, you've got to go clean the stalls, you know? <laughs> that's funny because I used to ride, I was an equestrian, I used to ride horses and I've picked up, I've shoveled so much shit. Yeah, right? It's like not For that bad. No, because yeah. that's your pet though, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And actually horse poop is like, cow shit is different. That, yeah, that it's is a pie. Pungent. It's a pie. Totally. But also, but like horse shit has like a sweet smell. Like yeah. when I smell it now, it reminds me of my childhood. Yeah, yeah. It's like I like the smell of mulch. I think is mulch ho horse poop? Um, I know it's like rotting vegetation. I don't okay. know if horse poop because I mean horse I poop it's like is compost. Or something. Yeah, it might be. Because I like the smell of mulch and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I mean horses are vegetarians, right? So what they poop out is in a way rot like better rotting vegetation. So yeah. there, I yeah, I think there's could be like a similarity there. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. It was, it was really cool. I'm really good at braiding my hair. Yeah. I have short hair, but I'm really good at braiding long hair. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And you've always been like very organized and very clean. That's mm -hmm. like, I, I love that about you. Um, I know that like you're very, like your house is like really beautiful and well decorated yeah. and you're very, um, you're very structured. So you feel like you learned a lot of that from the Amish. Totally. I actually, so I just hired an assistant and he keeps putting my dishes away and I had to yell at him because I was like, I know this seems crazy, but you have to wipe the spoons and the forks off before you put them away because I hate spots. Mm -hmm. And I was like thinking about it and I was talking to him and I was like, oh, I know exactly where this this mannerism came from. Because when I was younger, you have to wipe all the spoon silverware off before you put it away. So now if I see like any spots in my silverware, I freak out. I'm a little, little crazy. Well, you also have that thing about um, brushing your teeth, right? And people who spit and like don't wipe down the basin and don't wipe yes, down the faucet. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember you saying that. Yes. That's like my number one pet peeve right there. It's crazy. It's crazy. I, you know, I can... I can relate. Um, so you are really into science. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when I interviewed you for Bombshell of the Month, you were saying that you were like really into like building computers. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me every time I talk to you, you're on some new 
thing. You're like doing some new, you're, you have some new challenge ahead of you. You have something new that you're learning. Um, where does that come from? Do you think? Um, I think I'm just very curious. I think I, I really love to learn. Like that's, I think learning is like the best thing you can do for your brain. Um, also your person and, uh, stagnation is like, you know, it's, it's terrible to sit still. Um, so I think it just comes from my curious mind. I think when I was younger, I always had people tell me like, you have to do this. You have to go to school or you have to babysit or you have to do like, you know, even BS homework. Um, and I would always question that. So I think a lot of it just comes from, you know, my, my questioning, uh, and, and just being curious of things like, so right now I'm actually trying to make a keyboard. So, because I can't find a keyboard that's good for, for me and my fingernails. Uh, when I have long nails, mm -hmm. it's really hard to use a gaming keyboard. And I'm like, you know what? Like, why don't I just make my own keyboard? And then I can also market it to women um, with long nails and female gaming's on the up and up. Um, so I do hope in the next like two to three years, one of my goals is to have an electronics company where I'm just doing like female friendly uh, gaming tools, stuff made for smaller hands. So I think I just like creating things. I like to leave, I like to leave a mark or I like to do something where other people can find value out of it. That's, that's amazing. I mean, that's something that, you know, is, is needed. I mean, I don't game, but I could see how there would be a market for that. Yeah. And nobody ever considers like gaming and like that women might need something that like is physically structured a little bit differently. Totally. Just like looking at mouses, if you're a female and you're, say you're a competitive female, like a gaming mouse is probably like, it's like this big, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to click all the side buttons. So most women I know that are gamers use these huge mouses for competition. And I'm like, why is there no small, like tiny mouse that still has the same quality? And I think it's just like, I don't know if it's, like no one's jumped in on it or the gaming community, but I do find it like extremely wild. But I think, you know, we're in such a good time right now where women are kind of like, we're breaking into all types of roles, all types of industries. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of women in the gaming community were shunned before to where they felt like they couldn't do these things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's like a great time. I'm like, yeah. it's the best time to do all this awesome stuff. That's so interesting. I, I believe it too. Yeah. Adriana's electronics. Yes. I right. I right. see it. I see it coming. Right. I want to do, um, I want to make my own PC. So I have, my computer is called the nasty box. So <laughs> I plan on, I plan on, um, having oh a few that I can sell a year so you can buy my box. Oh my God, that's so clever. I <laughs> love right? that. Right? That is so great. So let's jump back um, into porn, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me about your first scene. Ooh, okay. Well, that was the come fiesta with the girl. Right. Um, I think it was it was me, a girl named Chloe, who's not in the industry anymore. And I think his name's Juan Largo. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I was like super nervous because I had to eat her out. And... You know, one of the things I specifically remember is I just remember having to say, like, a password and flashing my tits. Because for that scene, they're like, oh, you have to say something for them to, like, let you in the door. Mm -hmm. And I remember being like, okay, this is, like, the cheesiest thing I've ever done. Um, but the most ironic thing is, in the moment, I thought I was, like, such an old, like, woman. And I was like, yeah, I'm this, like, hot woman porn star. And even though I was nervous, I was like, this is going to be so great. And then I look back on that, and I'm like, whoa, I am, like, I am... Not obviously not a teen, but I'm very young, adolescent looking. Like, I look, you can see the fear in my eyes. Yeah. But it's so crazy how, like, I thought I was, like, so powerful in that moment. Um, I mean, it felt very powerful, very free freeing as well. So that was really, really awesome. And then after that scene, I think I booked, like, 10, 12 more scenes right after that. It was, like, such a good experience for me. Did you start with an agency or did you just book them independently? I had, okay, I had like a, I think he was like a pimp. Mm. <laughs> I'm not like quite sure. Like I got really lucky because when I started porn, I already had an apartment. I had a car. Um, and this guy was trying to make everybody stay in his house. He had like a house. And then he, I remember specifically like really cute dog, but he wanted everybody, you had chores when you stayed there. So you had to pay $1,000 and then you had chores and you had to like walk his dog, pick up the poop, do the dishes vacuum the apartment. And I was like, this is like, 
like the more I looked at it, I was like, this is like a very like kind of like pimping thing. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't sleep or do anything dirty with the girls, which is good. Um, but, you know, he would always, me and him would get into fights because he would always argue with me because he'd be like, oh, well, you're too independent. You have to stay here if you have a shoot because I don't trust you're going to show up. And I'm like, I'm like a, I'm like a 20 year old woman. Like I have a car and he would try and tell me I couldn't drive the car and I would get mad at him when we get in fights. And then, um, towards the end of my time with him, he actually was like, well, I think your independence is spreading to the other girls because I've always been the person to tell girls like, no, this is like, this is weird. This is like fucked up. Like my entire life, I've kind of always gotten in trouble for telling people like, you see this weird situation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I got really lucky because he was booking everything. And because I was so independent and I was kind of like, this is the things I want. um, He still gave me good rates. Like, I did my first anal, which was seven minutes on camera. And at the time, I got $3,700. Wow. No, seven minutes of actual anal penetration, right? Not a seven-minute scene. No, just seven. Yeah, the the scene was longer, but it was seven minutes of anal penetration. Okay. Um, And I got $3,700. And That's a good that's a good rate. Yeah, yeah. Like, after I started doing anal after that, that's when my late, my rate ro- lowered, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, like, I was still so amazed. So, like, even though he's kind of dick, I think he was, like, I think it's the same way with agents as well. They kind of pick and choose. Mm-hmm. And I think they can see not necessarily, like, star power in girls, but I think they can see uh, marketing power in girls. Mm-hmm. So if they see, like, I had no tattoos, natural boobs, they're like, oh, okay, we can get a lot of money out of this girl. And also we want to treat her a little bit better because she'll stick around with us. Right. Um, but then I quickly, I think I did about 12 scenes and then went to California mm. and came here right away. So you were doing all of this in Florida, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, so after your first porn scene, how did you feel afterwards? Do you feel like this is definitely the career for me or this wasn't what I expected or? I think, you know, it's so crazy because I can't remember like how I felt afterwards besides the simple fact that I got to go to bed at a normal time and wake up at a normal time. Mm. Um, And it's crazy because uh, I don't know if I had a drug problem because looking back, I I won't say I had drug problems, um, but I think I was just really young and I was a stripper. I was living that life in Miami. Um, But I think the best part about it and what was really cool is after it is I did it sober. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole day was amazing. I felt everything. I didn't have any like weirdness. Like sometimes when you're working in a strip club, you will feel uncomfortable and people turn you down. So it's kind of awkward. Um, but it it was just such a good experience that, you know, I was like able to, to get paid a good amount of money, work at 8am, be done by 5pm, um, and, and be sober. And I really say like moving forward, I'm like, Porn, in a way, I think helped save my life and put me on a good structure because my mother was addicted to drugs, is addicted to drugs. Um, People from my family are addicted to drugs, and I'm the only one that's not. And I think the structure of porn really is the reason why I didn't because you can't go to set fucked up. Like, yeah, maybe some girls show up that way, but it's very, very rare. And they don't do a good scene or they don't last. People don't hire them. Like, you really have to treat your body good to, to work. And yeah. I think that was like a blessing in disguise for me. I'm glad that you said that because that goes counter to what so many people think about porn. People yeah. think that everybody's on drugs. People think that it's like a big party scene and, you know, everybody's just like this damaged psycho deviant. And yeah. it. I try to explain to people, it's kind of one of the reasons I started this podcast, like dude, it's such a job. It's such like a nine to five yeah, job. Yeah. Like you have to be there on time. And, you know, we have like a shot list of like things I have to hit and mm-hmm. I have to make sure, you know, like I generally have like a guide for my client of like all these things I have to do. It's not like just people like laying around. Get and there and like, party. Yeah. Exactly. And I know some sets are like that I've heard, but yeah. like most sets and definitely like the more prestigious mainstream companies, they're, they're very structured. Yeah. I've only ever been on sets where it's like, um, people smoking weed. Yeah. And I've actually walked off three of those sets Mm. or I had a, I had one of the crazier agents, but he was good in the sense I could call him Mm -hmm. and he would lock it down. Like everyone would be terrified. I remember like, gee, I wonder who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I remember everyone like smoking weed on one set and it was like all the employees and stuff, which like weed is cool, but 
I I can't have sex and and be stoned. Like yeah. I can't even be stoned around people. If I'm gonna smoke weed, it's solo. I need to take a bath because I'm panicking a little bit, you yeah. know? Yeah. So I remember being on set and everyone's like getting high, and I'm like, holy fuck, I'm like starting to get stoned right now. And yeah. I started like panicking and called him and he was like, Well, you're not smoking weed, are you? I'm like, no. And he's like, okay, we'll tell everyone to go outside. And I'm like, but the whole inside smells like weed. Like I'm freaking out right now. Yeah. And um he called everybody. I think I think they all got in trouble. And I think we actually, no, we did. We ended up moving locations because it smelled like weed. They were like, okay, well, if we just move to a different house, will that be okay? I was like, okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a couple of those stories. And, like, I just, I don't, I mean, I don't smoke weed. Like, no one on my set smokes weed. I'm like, yeah. sometimes the models, like, you know. Yeah, like some it's model- California. And it's California, and there are some models that like to get high before they're seen, and, like, they still do a great job. It's just, yeah. like, their lifestyle, and I'm just like, whatever, just go outside. I'd yeah. rather you didn't, but, you know, I'm yeah. not argue with you about it. But definitely not, like— A party. No, it's not I, a party at all. I was working for—okay, so I learned I learned my lesson about this um, specifically because I was working for— uh, Girls Gone Wild, mm -hmm. and it was my first week in California. We're in Venice Beach at some, like, crazy house— the house had giant dinosaurs, like a uh, triceratops. And like, it was really weird. The guy was like a, um, a music producer. Mm -hmm. So he had a whole band upstairs, like practicing and everybody's downstairs and they're like doing dabs. And I'm like, okay, 21, it's my first week. Like, yeah, what's a dab? Let me try a dab. And I remember doing a dab and then they're like, all right, Adriana, now you get to climb on the triceratops and do a, do a solo. And I was like, so stoned. I looked at this thing and I was like, <gasps> what <laughs> like freaked out and I remember trying to climb on it I got on top of it and then all the guys that were um doing their like uh music their their music whatever they were doing up there it was a balcony to where they could look down to all the dinosaurs and I like look up and they're all like hey what's up and I'm like 21 so stoned if you've never done a dab it's the most like concentrated thing you can do of weed um, and I looked up and I just started bawling, crying oh, and I like no. grabbed all my clothes and I was like, I need to get out of here right now. And I literally got an Uber and ran home. I didn't tell anybody why I left. I was just like, I can't be here. And then my agent was like, what was wrong with you? And I was like, I'm still so stoned right now. Like I was like sitting in the bathtub, like he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I'm stoned. I can't handle this. You know, <laughs> so I'm like California weed is like a, a whole different thing too. That sounds like, I mean, I feel like I would freak out as yeah. well. It's like you get high and then you climb up on this like triceratops yeah, like, and then there's like a bunch of random dudes like who aren't part of the shoot that are like watching yeah. you from the, like there's so many things there that are just like not okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's girls gone wild. So they're yeah. like, oh, just like flash and do all these like crazy things. And, and you're just like tripping out on the top of this triceratops. Yeah, I remember like the thing I kept thinking about, which is like funny. So like um, my legs were numb and mm -hmm. I kept thinking like, am I peeing myself? Because my thighs, <laughs> the inner part of my thighs were numb. So like that's the part I was like really geeking out on because I was like, am I like peeing? And I had to keep like looking down. So it, and then and then years later, I'm a squirter and I would be like, yeah. woo! You know, <laughs> totally fine. But at least you knew you were doing that. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. like this, oh my God. Involuntary weirdness. Yeah. <laughs> Is that like, do you have, what are, do you have any other kind of crazy like set stories? I know you've done like so many scenes. <gasps> oh my gosh. Let's see. I mean, there's so, honestly, there's like so many bizarre things. I think like, you know, I've had the cops show up, which yeah. I feel everyone, everyone We've in the industry that. has. Yeah. Um, but uh, the difference is, is I was doing something for, uh, I forget, it was a different kink website, but they had tied me up outside and my arms and legs were tied to, to the bottom of the ground. And they were like, scream, right? So I'm like screaming. And um, the neighbors called the cops because they heard a girl screaming bloody murder. Oh my God. So not only did just like a few cops show up, like 30, 40 cops showed up. And then they thought they didn't want to believe the directors and everybody that I wasn't being abused because when they showed up, I was still tied to the grass, <laughs> right? <laughs> so then we had to wait like 20 minutes for them to bring female cops. And these female cops were like, okay, I need to talk to you in private. Of course. And they had to take me to like in the cop car privately. And it took me about like 
I don't know, I felt like a half an hour of just being like, no, I want to be here. Like, I was booked to be here. This is a part of it. And they were ironically really nice. They were like, okay, can you just like scream? Like, don't scream so loud because your neighbors are really afraid for you. You know? Oh my God. <laughs> so that was like really, really funny because there were so many of them. And um, I think I got a picture with all the cops. Like afterwards, I was like, can I get a photo with you guys? Like, <laughs> oh my God. I'm surprised that they let the shoot like continue. Yeah. Because every time really the cops weird. show up, they always shut you down. It's like, it was like somewhere, somewhere like deep, deep in California. Like okay. I remember I had to drive like two hours. So okay. maybe that's why, because they were just like, oh, crazy stuff happens here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh it my God. Crazy. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, you've talked openly about um, fucking fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell me about like, the first fan that you had sex with and like kind of what your parameters were for that? Totally. Um, I'm trying to think, okay. So I think the first fan stuff I actually ever did was at raves. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I, I still go to a lot of raves, but I remember being like, Oh, we're going to play a game. Where's Adriana instead of where's Waldo first fans to find me get a blow job. Um, and this is at the time where like, uh, what was, what was like really going off? I think Snapchat was really mm-hmm. going off. Um, and I had all my model releases like digitally. Mm-hmm. So I remember being like, oh, if you can find me, get a free blowjob. And then uh, I had throughout the night, like maybe like six or seven fans came and found me. Um, but none of them were brave enough. Right. Right. <laughs> so I finally found a girl fan. And what was the funniest thing about it is she had her boyfriend and she was like, oh, my boyfriend's here. He loves you. Like, can you just wait? Like, I'm going to go get him and come back. And I think I was running around the rave. Like two hours later, she shows up and she's like, this is my boyfriend. Like, you've got to suck his dick. And my first actual like fan blowjob or fan experience was with a, a, a couple. And me and her both gave a blowjob and filmed it at the rave. And I remember it got put on some like rave outlet, like, uh, uh, we think Adriana, Adriana Chechik was spotted sucking off a fan and it's just like the back of mine and her head just like going like this. Oh my God. <laughs> it was really good for my Snapchat too. Um, so I bet people, wait, and you had electronic model releases? Yeah, yeah. So I'd be, so like, did, like, yeah, I'd be like, here's a free blow job if you sign this. And then um, this is what I love about you. Like this dirty side of you where you're yeah. like, I'm going to give a free blow job to like the first like fan that I find. But also like I'm organized yeah. and coherent enough to be like, oh, you have to sign yeah. a model release. Like it's like that business side. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love that. Well, That's so I funny. Also, so I, I always I always vouch for this because people, even within porn, uh, some girls wouldn't want to work with me or they would be like, oh, you're too crazy. You do you do unprotected stuff. But ironically, is like uh, even some of those scenes I've released publicly because I love like flavored condoms mm-hmm. um, and glow in the dark condoms and stuff like that. So I'm like, ironically, like. I'm also being safe. And then I've always carried around Oraquix. I don't know mm-hmm. if you know mm-hmm. what those are. So you can get Oraquix at like CVS and stuff like that. It's a 99% effective STD test. Oh, wow. And you just like swab the inside of somebody's mouth and then you wait like 10 minutes and it'll give you the results. So, cause I like, get hooked up with girl fans and yeah. stuff. Um, and I'm like, here, hold on. Can I just like swab you real quick? Yeah. <laughs> quick um so it's really funny because people think I'm like super crazy and dirty but I am within bounds you know yeah within really good limits I feel like you're really great with branding and your image yeah but then you also have this very business side to you which is like here's an STD test yeah here's a model release totally. like let's actually you know this is a transactional thing totally that's and so cool I had you know also like I've always protected myself because I never want anybody to try and make me take back the content right you know? yeah, you're yeah, like yeah. and I feel like um you know if you throw if you throw a model release in somebody's face it causes them to double think, okay, do I really want to be filmed or not? Right. Um, So they know it's legit. But I will say one of my like funniest fan experiences was probably my blow bang. Mm -hmm. I had gotten a bunch of guys to do a fan blow bang. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was like, I'll give you like a flashlight photo, you know, if you just want to come, come do it and I'll pay for your test. Mm -hmm. And I had, I think 17 guys, Uh, three of them were virgins and some of them flew all from different states to California to shoot this. And it was so wild because um, not only they were, were they really, really good, like they put me on, they put me on a, a spinning stool 
And they were like spinning me around, like fucking my face and everything like that. And it was so good. Like at the end of it, um, I was like, wow, that's so good. And at the time I had a boyfriend and an assistant and I was like, whoa, this was so good. We, we filmed 58 minutes nonstop. Mm -hmm. Everyone came on time. And then my boyfriend at the time turns to me and he's like, mm, I gave everyone a Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, oh. he was like, I wanted to make sure you had a good day, you know? <laughs> But it's ironic because I find that fans sometimes are better than male performers because um, especially when it comes to like multiple guys and having to come on time because they're so excited. Yeah. They really want to try hard. Yeah. And then um, they don't have that kind of jaded, jaded mentality. Like, um, you know, I, I love our male performers, but to get them all to come when you want them to come, if you're doing like multiple pop shots is really fucking hard yeah you know some yeah. of them's like oh i need two minutes in the corner yeah so i find the fans are great because if they see another guy come on you they're like oh i'm done and then yeah. you know come on you so it's like perfect it is a weird like chain reaction isn't yeah, it it's yeah. like one guy comes like i've talked to people about bukaki like bukaki scenes like this and it's like a weird like one guy comes and then like all the rest of them like yeah it's like, yeah it's really bizarre yeah and then it's like the worst if somebody's got to take their like two minutes to themselves yeah. you know you're like oh everything was perfect I you know. know and then you just sit there with all this come on your face and you and it's starting to get cold and like yeah. maybe dry on your face and you're like come the fuck on dude yeah, and then yeah. like you're not in the moment anymore exactly exactly <laughs> I was just telling um uh I was streaming and I was telling people about the girl who I drowned in the bukkake and I was like that's probably because they left her in it for too long wait a minute wait a minute what what is the story okay so in 2017 there was a girl who drowned in the bukkake like drowned like died she did she did in Japan it was it's like a wild story because like talk about you know going out with a bang literally yeah. you know she um had I think it was like 30 guys come on her but she was like gargling the cum for so long because they want it in her mouth that the director is like, oh, well, we think she was gargling it for so long. And then she started to choke and we thought it was a part of the show. And then no one wanted to go and- Give her like the Heimlich? Yeah, like eventually one of, one of the guys went and he was like, I scooped out, there's like a quote where he's like, I scooped out as much as I could and then tried to give her uh, CPR, but by then it was too late. And I'm just like, whoa, like, I'm like, maybe if they all could have came on time, it never would have happened, you know? <laughs> that is fucking bananas. Mm -hmm. and because Holy shit. I think I started talking about this because, um, I don't know if you know, but um, I was going to do my first Bukkake and um, Veronica Avlov was like, let me give you a little bit of uh, tips. Uh, you want to make yourself purge all the cum you swallow or make sure you eat a lot of bread beforehand. And I was like, why? And she was like, because the mass amount of cum is like protein and it will make you go to the bathroom for hours. And that's how I got started on this conversation because I was like, okay. But I was talking to other girls and they all said that too. Like, and I come to think about it, I swallowed 25 loads one time and then I did have kind of like the runs for the rest of the day and I'm like bro like you guys have no idea like the the funny stuff that happens after porn because of all the things you're putting your body through yeah you know and it's it's so funny it is it is a lot on your body yeah it's it's, you're an athlete. You're a sexual yeah. athlete. That's exactly. That's so exactly true. Yeah. I say that all the time. That's that's what I that's what I like to call myself. I'm like yeah. I'm a sexual athlete. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, I mean, very few people can do what you do. Yeah, I think we all know that. <laughs> all right, guys, we're gonna take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're gonna talk a little bit more about Adriana's career, and we're gonna talk about the end of her career. Is Adriana gonna stop doing porn? <laughs> Hang tight. We'll be right back. With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. 
So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. All right, guys, we are back. So we just talked about how you are very much a sexual athlete. What kind of pre and post scene rituals do you have? Um, so before scenes, uh, about like 24 hours before scene, I like to really stretch. Like I will say probably about like 10 days leading up to scenes because you don't want to stretch where you're sore. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was shooting actively, I was very into yoga. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I'm going to do a scene that's like uh, a lot of my body, it's a lot of moving. I do a lot of yoga, especially the night before I'll probably do like a, a super flow yoga or something like that. Um, and then... I think I'm kind of opposite to a lot of people is I try and just act also normal. Like, like a lot of people like not eat, you know, because they're like, oh, I, I don't want to like look fat for the scene before um, or do all these like crazy things. And I think like the best thing you can do is to like keep your body on a regular like time, time frame, like eat regularly, eat regular hours. So your digestive is going at the same time, even if it's not anal, you know, that way you're not bloated because you didn't eat. And then you take a sip of water or something on mm -hmm. set. Um, and then I always just like to, uh, the night before, like, I just like to take like a long bath, relax. If it's like a gangbang or something, I still get nervous, um, which is like ironic. So I kind of, um, I kind of will like go on a hike or do something to, to calm my nerves, uh, or just like listen to music and meditate before I sleep, especially the morning of, I'm normally really, really nervous. Mm -hmm. So, and then aftercare. So this is where I went wrong. And this is where, this is where I wish I could, I wish somebody would have told me and I wish I could tell girls, um, I didn't do much aftercare. Like after gangbang, I take an ice bath. After mm -hmm. DPs, I take an ice bath. Um, just because it helps with soreness because sometimes you feel like you're in like a 20 mile per hour car accident mm -hmm. with all the jolting. Um, uh, but other than that, I never really did anything besides like eat a full like pizza or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. sleep for like a day. But, you know, looking back on it, I wish I could have learned um, decompression. Mm -hmm. So, like, any time I was in a position where I was compressed or contorted, I wish I would have known to do the same amount of time that I was in that position of decompressing because I have uh, uh, IVDD and my C5, 6, 7, and 8. Um, my 7 and 8 have a pinched nerve and my disc is slipped. And I think it's a direct cause of a pile driver and not, yeah. not doing anything to, to fix those. Um, so it's getting better, but definitely if you're somebody that wants to get in porn or anything like that, like work your body out afterwards. Take yeah. good care of it. Yeah. I mean, you really do have to look at it as, I mean, you think about, you know, all these successful athletes and how much aftercare they do and mm -hmm. how much pre-care they do. And what my PT actually works actively with a lot of, um, NBA players and mm -hmm. like the, the work that they constantly have to do on their bodies for what they put it through. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot like yeah, a totally. gangbang and pile driver anal and all that shit's like, that's, that's a lot to put on your body. Yes. Most of us have sex for like 10 minutes, like yeah. in missionary, you know what I mean? It's hard to imagine like, and it, when I film you guys, you know, and if we're doing like a 30, 40 minute scene, I'm always like, how the fuck are they like, how do they keep going? Yeah. Like, are you tired? <laughs> like, I'm tired and I'm filming this. Yeah, totally. It's just so much. Totally, totally. It's crazy. It's insane. It's wild. I, I've done, I've done like a four hour gangbang before. And I look back at those times and I, I loved it, but I look back and I'm like, holy fuck. Like, that's wild. Were there no breaks? <sighs> um, You know... I think I had like some mild breaks, but I you think, must have taken a break because you got to like change the card in the camera. I had like mild right? breaks and like getting water and stuff like yeah. that. But you know, for the most time, like they would be still like fucking me. You know, I'd just be yeah. like getting water while someone's doing something. Yeah. Um. I think I think because I talked to girls like later on in my career, um, and then I've had some other girls work with me and Darko, and they've been like, "Are you like exhausted? I'm exhausted right now because." You know, if you have a good model or you like working with somebody, you kind of have a synergy mm -hmm. where you just like let it flow. And like, especially with Darko and stuff, 
um, we just didn't stop because it was so good. Yeah. So I think I think I'm a little different because when I start talking to other girls, they're like, "Oh, I never filmed that long because I'd just be having fun and we'd be yeah. filming like great stuff." So yeah. I kind of would just keep filming it, like, "Okay, if you want to keep going, keep going," you know? Because yeah. you're so, just so in the moment. Yeah, yeah, and I like to just be crazy. It's it's empowering. So I was gonna say, like, why do you think that you love the? Because you know, there's. There's this idea of, um, and actually your name has come up in my show before, because there's there's this idea that like women who do gangbangs or do these like cra- crazy scenes are kind of being forced into it, or it's something that they're doing just for the money and they don't really want to do it. And I'm always like, if you've ever seen like Adriana perform, like that girl wants to be there. Yeah. Like it is very much like her show and she's into it. So like, what do you think it is about those scenes that you enjoy so much? Uh, it's the power. It's, it's the, so you feel empowered. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel, I feel empowered. And then also like, it's really hot to control a bunch of men. Like, you know, I'm in a situation not only where I'm empowered because everybody's worshiping me. Um, and then collectively you have a whole room of people collectively, including the director and everyone that's helping the scene that want you to have a good time, that want you to feel good. So as you're feeling good, they're kind of all cheering you on. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just like, kind of commanding guys. Like I like yelling at them, to be honest. Like some of my favorite things to do in a gangbang is if there's a guy standing behind drinking off, I'll turn around and yell at him and be like, my elbow and arm is free right here, you know? (laughs) And I'm like yelling at them to fuck random parts of me. So I always think that's like one of the best things. And then um, I think it also just goes along with like, I like to push my limits. Mm -hmm. And my favorite thing is to put people in a room where they think they're going to push my limits and then have them be the one that's like, Oh my God, I'm dead tired. Right. You know, like it's actually towards after I've done a few gangbangs, it would actually be hard to book, book gangbangs. It was hard to book them for me because a lot of guys would be like, yo, Adriana's like crazy. This is going to be a harder day. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, it's going to be funner, but it's going to be harder because of it to where we would struggle booking talent for them. Cause they like can keep up with you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I love that. I think I'm like, I think I turn into like a monster. That's why I have the, <laughs> the brat, nat- brat nasty alter ego yeah. because I think in gangbangs and situations like that, brat nasty comes out where she's just like this bratty sex machine that's like, give me the nastiest stuff you can do and do it how I want you to do it. You know? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think that, I mean, you do these gangbangs and you feel so empowered and then you have so many people who, who look at this from an outsider's perspective and think that you're assume that you're being degraded. Why do you think people like default look at it that way? Um, I think because people only see what they want to see, right? Like, like it's the same thing. Like it's the same thing how you look at situations. Mm -hmm. If you look back at a situation in your life, right. And you look back at it from a place of like sadness or anger, you're going to actually see that situation as something being more, more aggressive or something bad versus if you look back at it in, in a happy way, you're going to feel happiness towards that memory. Mm-hmm. So I think like people look at some of the porn that I've done and instead of actually paying attention to my body and the words that I say, they're paying attention to just a person getting demolished mm-hmm. instead of like actually seeing me, Adriana, the actual performer mm-hmm. commanding the room. Um, and I think it's just so outlandish for people. It's something that they can not put themselves doing. They can't picture it being that type of way that, um, I don't think they really have the understanding of how freeing it is. I don't think, you know, for them to, for people to go and be naked in public, they think like, oh my God, embarrassment because they've never even allowed their brain to be open up to the idea of, of how that could be empowering or how that can be something that's freeing, you know? Cause they don't celebrate their bodies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I definitely think that people look at everything. We, I think we all do. We look at everything through the lens of our own experience, right? Mm-hmm. So I think people look at you and they, one always places themselves in that position. Mm-hmm. Like, could, how, like, this is how I would feel if I did it because I carry with me the stigma of sex, whatever shame I experienced around it growing up, whatever totally. I was taught, whatever I was told. And then that's what I bring to my experience viewing this. Mm-hmm. And because I would feel that way, she must feel that way. Totally. And I think people like forget one of the things that I think we as human beings just do in general is that 
we forget that like other people think and feel differently than we do. Exactly. Everyone's experience is different. Yeah. And I think it's really ironic because uh, some of my biggest fans and the most people that that praise me for my gangbangs are women. Mm. Like I have the most amount of women tell me like, I love this scene. I did this because you did it. I tried something crazy because I saw you do it. Um, so it's really ironic. And, and that just goes to show how much more a woman is paying attention to the body language. I think that's a big thing across. And so, sorry, sorry, men, mm -hmm. but I don't think they pay enough attention to body language or body signals. Mm -hmm. If they would, then sex would probably be better with more men to be honest. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? Do you think that that's part of like the fact that we just don't, as a society, we don't talk about sex and we don't communicate about it and we don't like talk about connecting with people. We just kind of see it and we imitate it. Totally. I also think it's just like for most people, it's an act, mm -hmm. right? Everyone yeah. thinks of sex as an act yeah. rather as an emotion, right? So instead of thinking it as like, oh, this is an act we're doing. This is an emotional journey we're going to experience. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people don't read body language. Like I think especially when it comes to men, there's a very real thing about like holding in your emotions. And I think you know, just the way our society has made men, um, you know, have to be a little more silenced about their feelings has actually caused the problem of building the wall. So where they're unable to notice emotion as much. God, that's so true. That's really, that's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, we hold men to the standard of like, you know, you have to be a man, you have to suck in your mm -hmm. feelings. You're not supposed to express your emotions. And yeah, I mean, obviously that would create this kind of yeah. Barrier. Yeah. By doing that, by having them, if you limit your own emotions, you're going to stop seeing other people's emotions, right? Because the way you yeah. think carries on to how you see other people. Yeah. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so with all your experience in the adult industry, what is, is there anything that you wish you had done differently? Is there anything you know now that you wish you had known getting in? Um, uh, there's two, two big things I would have done differently. Um, well, well, two things I wish I wish I could have known and stuff. Um, the first thing is, you know, I wish I would have thought more on not how the actions are going to impact my future um, and how people are going to view me for it, but how the emotions are going to impact my connection with others. Mm. So I often think like as a CEO, you, you sometimes sacrifice hanging out with your kids. Um, I worry, one of my biggest fears uh, that I'm trying to get over is, um, did I sacrifice my uh, emotional connection with people to do some of these first or to have true intimate passion with people for this type of career? Mm. Um, because while I've experienced passion on camera and had very, very beautiful intimate moments, um, Adriana's gotten so big that it's a little hard to connect with anybody on my personal level now. Like. Yeah. To meet somebody, you know, it, it, it sucks. Like if I go on a date, I, I often will get uh, plan a date with somebody. And then slowly the date will turn into being an hour later. Then it's 8 o'clock at night. Oh, meet me at a hotel. I get to the hotel. They just want to bang. Or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's taken a lot of, a lot of um, I guess, a lot of intimacy from me. Like people don't give me the respect of giving that, giving me the treat a woman how she should be treated moments. So that kind of sucks. Um, I'm hoping I'll get it. I have a fear, but you know, maybe as I grow and change um, and get older, I'll find somebody to do those things with. And then um, if I could take anything back in my career, it'd be the public actions that I did that weren't for companies. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I squirted on an escalator. Mm -hmm. While that did a lot for my brand in the sense of making me catapults and people were like, wow, this is crazy. What I realize now is those moments are actually hindering me from um, average society wanting to work with me because they only see, see me in that light. Mm -hmm. um, they also hinder me in a sense where, you know, people think to do those type of things, you're a partier, you're on drugs. Um, so I wish that I was able to see my brand when I was younger so I could understand the impact of my actions on my brand at all times. Yeah. So I could be a little more honed in because there's a difference in doing porn and, and doing crazy things. And then there's also a difference between like living those crazy acts. Mm -hmm. So, and like now if I go out in public and I see girls like, 
I, I, I went to a party and these girls were like fucking in the middle of the street. And, you know, I was like that. So I can understand the freeing exhibition of it. But at the same time, like, I'm just like, some people don't want to see that. Now you're exposing it to them. Yeah. And, you know, like I kind of almost see some of the actions I had like as careless mm -hmm. because I didn't think about anybody else around me. I just did it for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. So I would have had a little more respect and a little more um, awareness for other people. Well, that's amazing. I mean, that you can like look back and grow as a person and, and see like how, you know, you would do things differently now. Not yeah. everybody does that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I didn't see that I was making a brand at the time. Yeah. Right? Like, if I could have seen the power that Adriana as a brand has, I would have been like, oh, shit. Like, you can't act like that. But I was yeah. just so in the moment, you know, living yeah. for me, which is great. I had great times. But um, it's it's a little bit of a hindrance now. It's kind of one of those unfortunate things that you see, like, with today, especially with technology and cell phones and stuff. I think about you know, when I was young and I was in my early 20s and I was in college and all the stupid fucking shit that I did and, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the things that I would never do now, but we didn't have cell phones around. I de and I definitely wasn't like, you know, a performer or a star. I didn't have the eye of the world on me. Yeah. And so I could do all of these stupid things. I can grow and learn from them and they don't haunt me. But these days with technology, it's like everything that you do is online forever. And especially for yeah. you, like, you were, you know, a growing brand and you were a star and you had all these people watching you. So you had to go through all of this and learn all of these lessons in like the eye of the public. And that's going to yeah. be really tough. And I also wonder, um, I know like, I know the actions I did in scenes and the, and the type of porn I did was for me, mm -hmm. but I wonder, I wonder if, and I see a lot of my uh, actions off camera, my, a lot of my behavior wasn't for wasn't because of me it was more of the hype of adriana like i go out to a party and everyone's like oh adriana's here it's gonna be fucking wild mm -hmm. and then i'm getting naked on a table because adriana takes over the moment and it's like oh well everyone says it and i'm getting cheered on you know where where i'm like dang did i do that because i wanted to or i did that because the ego that was built behind adriana yeah so you know and i think i think there's this weird, especially today, there's this weird, like, let's go viral thing, uh, yeah. which I kind of hate because I think a lot of people are trying to go viral for the wrong, the wrong re reasons. Um, and it's creating this, like, really weird type of, you know, revolving media that that's that's not doing anything good for anybody besides yeah. just being crazy. Um, so I think I definitely contribute to, to some of that ugh, during my career. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that's, it sounds like you've really gone through like a huge growth in like personal growth period lately. Mm -hmm. I know that you mentioned um, before that you kind of like withdrew a lot from like your friends and from work and stuff. And then you found out that you had an, a hormone imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. That you got treated and now you feel very much yourself. Can you tell us about that time period a little bit? Uh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think, I think, I think it would have happened without the pandemic, but the, pa the pandemic was a catalyst for um, a lot of the unresolved issues I had. And I was like thrust into this awesome name, this awesome brand. And I worked so hard that I never stopped to actually pay attention to myself. Mm -hmm. I never stopped to actually um, have self-awareness or understand my own emotions. Everything I did was, was purely... Um, you know, kind of like the fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was purely based off of everyone else's reaction. So when the pandemic happened and I had no one telling me like, Adrian is awesome, you're pretty, blah, blah, blah. What was left was really, really shitty. <laughs> um, uh, it sucked. It sucked to be in my head for about a year, year and a half because I had to realize like, fuck, my inner monologue is so mean, so aggressive. Um, and, and has no idea how to love herself. And, um, through all of that, it was, it was so negative. I had to just read a lot of books. Um, you know, I started reading a lot of self-help books. I started writing down everything I could. Like anytime I had a negative emotion, I would write it down to figure out like, where can I trace this back to in my life? Where did this start? And, um, uh, I got I got really lucky that uh, I also went to a doctor at the same time just to check my hormones because I had a psychiatrist who was trying to tell me I had dissociative disorder and 
possibly multiple personalities, but she was also taking like four grand a month from me. Mm -hmm. And I started to feel like, wow, I'm paying a lot of money and I'm starting to believe I have all these problems. Um, but I don't think these are my issues. I think I have no idea how to uh, do time management because I grew up in foster care um, and then went to college. And then from college, I had an agent who structured my life. Mm -hmm. um, and now I have no one cheering me on. I have no one structuring me. Like, what's my real issues? I don't love myself. And um, I have no idea how to live time, time management wise. I have no idea how to function in a, so, as an adult. Um, and I have uh, a lot of like random things going on with my body. And I, then I turned 30. So I went to the doctor and he was like, oh, well, you have hypothyroidism. So I have really low thyroid which uh, I started having neck pain and stuff really bad. If you have a low thyroid, your thyroid actually controls a lot of your hormones. So it can cause negative emotions, negative thoughts, and your low thyroid actually uh, can influence how you feel pain. Mm. So when I got on medication, my pain was like 10 times better. You know, um, the negativity was not so aggressive. I was able to push it away a lot. Um, but you know, like even now I still have, I still have those things, but I've been so lucky to have the tools to, um, understand them. Like, uh, so yesterday I just got, I just got a trauma therapist because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do Twitch and, mm -hmm. um, I got swatted where they send a SWAT team to your house while you're live streaming because my address got out. So, uh, like 30, 30 cops showed up to my house in the middle of the night, uh, and they had guns pointed at me. They put me in the dirt, arrested me, thought I had somebody in my house I was trying to kill. Uh, then they had to go into my house, and I was live on stream, so you can see them running through my house. And uh, that happened three more times. So I've, I've had to take great lengths now to get my address hidden, building a gate, security. So that all happened, but I started to realize, um, I think I might have like PTSD from stuff that happened to me in my past because I am so hyper aware and so um, sensitive. Like I have an assistant and people that come work in an office in my house, but if they open the door, I immediately like jump and freak out and panic. Um, and I think a lot of the problems, including the health problems and stuff that's caused me to be self-aware is, is PTSD from my past and just like crazy things that have happened to me. Um, like my first year of porn, I had a uh, stalker. He tried to run me over and abducted me for about half an hour. And that moment alone, I just kept moving on to the next, let me just move on and shoot like a week later. Yeah. Um, you didn't really like have time to like process that. Yeah. Like I had no time to process anything. And I know, I don't think I ever even realized I needed to. Um, so, you know, I think that's just caused a lot of inter introspection. And, uh, that's why I really like haven't shot because I was like, I can't shoot with all of these things that I need to process and, yeah. and then try and tell myself like, Oh, you look good today at the same time. It was really, really hard. It was exhausting. So I'm, I'm in the midst of a journey. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. yeah it's been a yeah, wild one. That's like, <sighs> it's been a wild one. Um, so let's talk about the next steps in your life. Mm -hmm. You're going to quit doing porn. Yes. So exactly. tell us what what made you arrive at that decision and how are you transitioning out? Mm -hmm. um, so I came to that decision. I will say like Twitch has been the best blessing for me because I, for the first time in my life, was on a platform. Um, I wasn't even – now I'm making money from it, which is amazing, but I wasn't making money from it. But I was just somewhere where people were valuing me for me. Mm -hmm. Um and I call it a comp assault, but it's one of the best comp assaults is people coming in and they'll be like, wow, I never would have thought you're like this. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you have a personality. Yeah. You're a human being. E exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, in porn, everybody is very tight knit. Um, everybody, you know, talks about everybody's drama. Everyone talks about porn. And um, I was craving intellectuality. Like I was craving um, you know, learning and other stuff. And I just wasn't getting it in my friend group. And I, because I was so like enwrapped with my friends and so enwrapped in porn that I didn't have any notion of like the outside world. Mm -hmm. Um, so getting on Twitch really opened my eyes and a lot of people on there, like, you know, gave me education. Like I built, built a computer. Um, you know, I've done, I built a whole studio all on my own 
And um, just through the experiences and the conversations I've had on there have really made me realize like, oh, you're more than just how you fantasize yourself because I fantasize or fetishize myself, right? Mm-hmm. So it also gave me the understanding that I am I am more than this. And when I was younger, I always, always was like, no matter what happens, I can just up and switch. Mm-hmm. Like, if I don't like this, I can leave. If I'm not making money in this job, I can just move. You know, and I always lived in the moment with no fear of, of, of you know, what could happen. And I always thought positive. Um, so, you know, streaming helps me realize that. And through a lot of the stuff that I've gone through, through a lot of the trauma I've, I've had happen, I just started talking to people about it on that platform. Um, I started writing like, you know, like tools to help me get through things. And then I started sharing them with people. And that just made me realize like, I've hit all my goals in porn. I've, I've done everything I wanted to do. And I want to do something bigger and better. I want to leave my mark, uh, leave my mark. And I want to, I want to be a leader to help lead people to a goal that's bigger than me, a dream that's bigger than me. So, you know, I think I, I'm trying to, I want to get into life coaching. I want to get into just, you know, I want to get into, I call it like kindness coaching. I want to get into helping people realize like how kind the world is, how, how, you know, how, not fearful everything is and help people process things the way I did. And I believe that if I get into this next stage of my life and I could be successful and I can make my name as Adriana, but being something more than just the sex worker, Mm -hmm. that that right there would be proof to anybody else that's suffering or anybody else that's forgotten who they are to push through, you know? And that's what I want to help with. That's amazing. Yeah. Isn't it incredible like how, all of those ex- bad experiences that you had in your life, like all the trauma that you experienced, that you can take those things and you can turn them into something really good and something yeah. that can help other people. And it becomes, it, whereas it used to be like your downfall, it becomes like your asset. Yeah, yeah. Which is really Anytime interesting. Anytime there's a negative, there's always a positive. Yeah. Right? So. And it's so hard to get yourself to like believe that and yeah. to think that way. Yeah. So how do you like work? How do you process through all that stuff? You said you do writing. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of writing. Um, like for instance, if I have a negative thought, like even just like if I'm like watching the news and I'm like, oh, global warming, it's, we're doomed. You yeah, know, dude, I can't watch. I start anymore. writing it down. Like I'm like, we're doomed. Why do I think we're doomed? Because this isn't this. Mm-hmm. And then I look at it and I'm like, okay, so these are all things that are being like fed to me. Mm-hmm. These are all I'm writing down doomed things from what exactly I've heard. Mm -hmm. Now that I know that it's out of my head, my brain can stop feeding it to me. Let me go online and educate myself on, on scientific websites about all the good things that are happening and surround myself with just positive news. Wait, are you telling me that you're doing research I and do you're research. not just reading the headlines? Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. crazy. Mm-hmm. Nobody does that. Right, right. <laughs> I actually like, uh, I have my own discord and I purposely put positive, just like scientific advances, um, positive acts that people are doing because I'm like, it, we need more of that. Yeah. It, and it's not even like, it's not even like we don't have it. The thing is, is being positive and happiness is easy. You expect it when you're a human, right? So mm-hmm. you just live and you assume that things are going to be good. You assume that you're, you're happy. So that's why you don't see it or have that like relief of it because negativity is something you don't expect. So when it comes into your way, you see it and you take it in. But I'm like, you guys, like, if you would just realize, like, every day, just, like, getting up is, like, an amazing thing. Like, mm-hmm. being able to, even if you're you're strapped for money, but being able to get yourself that coffee, you know, because you've saved that 250 is an amazing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people just, like, forget that. And they're just so easy to listen to the negative because it's louder than the positive. Mm-hmm. But, like, you know, with everything going on in the world where we've got the most um, – green innovations uh, ever with the most legislation working against us. So we've done the most advances and it's actually more profitable to be green than it is to use all these other things. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we have the most science, uh, most science uh, advances in medicine right now. And when it comes to like feeding the homeless and all that stuff, we have the most activists working ever in America. And I'm like, why are so many of you listening to this like 
fear in your own brain. Because if you keep listening to that, it's going to make you lazy. It's going to make you not want to do things. Yeah. And it's really weird. And it's kind of like, it's a bad way to live, to live in fears. I can't imagine it, you know? Yeah. But it's also like what the media feeds us all the time. Because mm-hmm. what is the two things that sells? Sex and fear. Yep. And fear is like, that's what's being fed to you 24 hours mm-hmm. through the news channel. Like my dad... um, you know, he's got Parkinson's and he's 82. And so he does a lot of like just sitting and watching fucking CNN on repeat. Uh-huh. Um, and it's just like con- all this constant negative because people don't like they don't want to hear the stories about like, oh, all of the good things that are happening in life. It's the fear that sells because people totally. get like focused on that and they need to learn more about that. And then like mm-hmm. and I just feel like we're all like in this active state of anxiety all the time. Yeah. Totally. I think they're like, I wish there was a news outlet that was just like a positive one because uh, I think it's the same with porn. So like everyone wants brother and stepsister stuff, right? Yeah. So we create brother and stepsister stuff and then more people want brother and stepsister stuff. Like you watch news and it gives you bad stuff and then you want to watch more bad stuff. I think the market kind of creates um, the viewers and then it's like a vicious circle where the viewers start start doing it as well. But I think if somebody were to step in, a news outlet or something was to step in and create something different, you would see, sure, it might be a slow roll, but you mm. would see people would start changing to that type of way. Because after all the politics that just happened, what is CNN and all these websites now doing? They're talking about global warming in the worst way, mm-hmm. right? So now they're making people afraid to try to, to be better. They're making people, oh shit, well, the planet's already doomed, mm-hmm. right? If I talk about any global warming, well, we're already doomed. There's nothing we can do to fix it. No, that's not true. We've actually lowered it this year. We've lowered it by one degree, right? If we can get one more uh, degree lower for next year, we're, we're way ahead of the track that we've set for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you're just allowing, like, they're basically, they're basically fear-mongering you from, from being better and, and doing better because then you're kind of stuck on this this wheel, you know, and I don't want to say like consumption wheel because people start being like, oh, you're crazy and woke, but it really is. You're stuck on the same consumption wheel and fear mongering situation. Yeah, I know. It's so true. I mean, we're, we're, our society is so much about consumption and I'm totally guilty of it too. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm bad about that. And I've been trying to, to be better. It's funny because I saw this, um, article uh, that somebody posted on Instagram about how like 90% of the plankton has disappeared in the Atlantic Ocean. Like Mm -hmm. it's gone. And I like went to a full-blown panic attack. I mean, I've been seeing global, you know, global warming news everywhere, but I don't know. It was that specifically. And I spent like two days, like totally freaked out. Yeah. But you know what I did? I started, this is like a small change, but I feel like it's a good one. I found this company that does these laundry sheets that's mm-hmm. like detergent and it's just like little sheets like this called like eco something. And so instead of getting those big Tide bottles with all the plastic, yeah. you get these little sheets and you put, and I bought them and I put them in the laundry machine and they fucking work great. Yeah. And they come in a little cardboard thing like this big and it's See? recyclable and they're like, they don't have any uh, parabens or any of the bad stuff for you. So and better. it's not like bad for the environment and just the packaging alone. Like if you mm-hmm. think of all the plastic that we consume constantly we don't think about it yeah totally and but even like just that like little thing like even like the fact that I gave you a plastic water bottle like I should you know Reason. not have that like or I should have liquid death which comes in a, which comes in a recyclable <laughs> right. can right. Joanna send me more liquid death food anymore <laughs> I ran out but just like little changes like that um but that's what it is that's what people don't understand is they think like oh it's never going to change but like one small step, one small change makes huge changes. Mm-hmm. Everyone made a small change. It would be a big change. Yeah. And that's what people don't understand. They rather like give up instead of just like attempt to do something, you know? Yeah. I think either we fully discredit the whole global warming thing, which mm-hmm. we know that some people do. They're like, it doesn't exist. It's a mm-hmm. hoax. Or yeah, it does. It feels so hopeless. Like, well, fuck it. Yeah. Like I can't even imagine to like begin to try to do something about it because it just looks like nothing we do is going to change anything. Yeah. That's Which so is like, true. they're not listening to science. No. <laughs> like, those are the people that are not listening to science. But science doesn't sell. Yeah. Fear sells. So true. So weird. I love how we went from 
what <laughs> you're quitting porn to like plastic use. I don't know how we went down that fucking tangent. I love it. I love it. I actually, I, I often talk about, I often talk about that and I kind of talk about politics a lot too. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really ironic because I get a lot of uh, death threats now. I get a lot of craziness because of it. So since I've started to be more vocal, like this stuff I get is like so oh, people wild. People get so angry. I yeah, know. It's really like angry. so wild. I'm like, you We're guys We're so polarized. Crazy. It's, it's, it's yeah. Oh my God. Um, so you how need to be science scientists. That's all. I know. You know so just well, maybe you like need to start a science channel. That's true. Maybe, maybe you should just do like Adriana's science news. I just like, bought a giant volcano to build in my backyard <laughs> to try and like show everyone about just elementary science. I can believe it. Like, I, I, I love it. I was like, I'm going to the teacher supply store and we're going to do like elementary science for each year just to like try and like learn some funny stuff. That's so, so I do great. Some pretty funny things. That's really fun. <laughs> so how are you going to, so you, are you going to stop shooting for your OnlyFans entirely? Like mm-hmm. when is this change happening? How are you making this change? Um, so I'm kind of working on uh, getting myself into phases right now. Um, you know, like I would say I'm like in phase one. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so, you know, hopefully, hopefully within the next year and a half, I won't be shooting any sex. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I just have to get everyone to see me as something more first. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'm working on a couple of projects to try and kind of launch myself because I want to be uh, considered an activist as well. Mm-hmm. So I have a couple of projects that I'm going to, you know, launch at the same time as I do pushes towards uh, mainstream articles and PR and press like and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's been really cool because I've actually gotten uh, PR, like someone who's like, this is how you should I have if you want to try and get people to see you differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I have hopes to write a book because I think uh, like face- I was going to ask. I mean, yeah. I feel like you're in the perfect place to write a book. Yeah. So I want to do like phase two after people see me as something else, you know, release with a book. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to, and I also, uh, I want to get people to start coming to me for advice. So, yeah. you know, I want people to see me as somebody that can offer advice uh, next year, I'm going to go back to school just taking some night classes. So I have some actual um, degree and credibility behind me. Mm-hmm. So I know just in case the way my words can be taken, mm-hmm. um, yeah. so, you know, so I don't hurt anybody uh, while I do these things. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's, I, I mean, I experience this all the time when you're trying to convey a message. The way you say it is really important and it's it's hard to say it in the right way yeah because also too like you know when you look at some of these celebrities that you know do all these pr stuff like they have media training Mm -hmm. and i actually got a little bit of media training when i did my playboy tv show Mm -hmm. um and that was somewhat helpful but otherwise like we don't especially like sex workers and someone like you who becomes as big as you do you get zero media training and it's just like thrust into the public eye and just like sit you know what i mean and there's a certain way to convey your ideas and it takes like a little bit of finessing and it's, it's, it's hard. It is. I've gotten firsthand, uh, understanding the words I say and how they can be seen, you know? (laughs) So, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So I have just three questions for my Patreon members that I want to ask you. Um, Dave W says, uh, he said, I would like to ask you Jaron about her relationship with food. Mm -hmm. You have a perfect figure. Um, I assume you're on a calorie restricted diet. Do you ever find yourself staring longingly at food that you would like to eat, but you can't eat because it would change your figure? If you weren't in this industry, would you eat more? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of funny. So, um, I have a thyroid problem. So my thyroid is really slow. So I gain weight. I'm actually the heaviest I've ever been. Um, but I would say before, my brain was just so set on like, oh, I've got to look this way that I never looked at food as something like uh, pleasurable. I just looked at it for for sustenance. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to love myself as I am. I'm not trying to even lose weight. I'm not worrying about my weight. So if I see food and I want to eat it, I eat it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Um, So, you know, right now, I'm kind of just like enjoying myself. And I eat a lot of food. A lot of food. (laughs) Food is like... It's so good. That's the problem. But like with a thyroid problem, I'm I'm only doing around... um, probably 1100 calories naturally because I, I doing anal and stuff for years. Naturally, you just like don't eat a lot. Or you mm-hmm. eat one time a day. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's ironic because I'm like the heaviest I've ever been. And I'm actually still like not even eating as much because my thyroid and mm-hmm. 
when my hormones or my thyroid like dose needs to be upped, I can tell I'll gain like five pounds like that. So it's like, it's wild. It's wild. Wow. I'm like all the women out there with hypo or all the people out there. Like I get it. I yeah. get it. It's terrible. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's my grandmother like, had it actually. Yeah. I think it's something I'm always going to have to worry about. I think yeah. the weight and the hair loss and stuff is something you kind of always just have to manage. It's but crazy. at least you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're taking steps to combat it. So yeah. that's that's great. I, Having I, that knowledge. Yeah. My hair started falling out really bad. And I just got, I got to the point where I was like stressing about it and it was falling out more. So then I just bought a bunch of wigs and I was like, if it falls out, we're just going to wig it up and we're fine. You know? <laughs> and then it started growing back ironically. So. So like you, do you like remove the stress by getting the yeah, wigs? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I love that. Um, Howard Garcia says, I would like to know what is it with Twitch and the girls in the adult industry? Why do you keep getting banned when other girls do more scandalous shit and they get away with it? Well, um, (laughs) uh, the difference is, is the type of camaraderie we bring to the platform. Um, it's not what we do on the platform. It's what our viewers bring to the platform because of our actions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I may do something that another girl can do on that platform, but she's not going to have people be over-sexualized. She's not going to have um, people clip that and put it on other websites with the Twitch logo underneath. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, Twitch is entitled to doing what they want with their brand. They're entitled to, you know, taking care of it however they want. And, you know, I've gotten banned a few times for doing stuff other girls do, but that's just the way of the world. And I should know better myself looking back on it. I should know better. Um, and the type of attention that I bring to that platform, I should understand. I, I learned my lesson very hard with that the last time around. So, mm-hmm. you know, and everything is not always going to be, you know, equal, right? Every, life like, is not fair. Yeah. So instead of just like, you know, complaining about it and being upset about it, just like learn to be better. Right. And yeah. What's better, me getting on Twitch and wearing pasties with a shirt that I get banned and everyone being like, that's not fair, she shouldn't get banned. Or me being in a t-shirt, being a fucking badass gamer and everyone's like, wow, she's so good at games. Mm -hmm. So it's totally, I think it's fine now to just like listen to the rules. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Um, And then Carlos uh, asks, I'm going to go to my first adult expo next year. He wants to know if you have a recommendation of which expo he should attend or should he go to all of them? Oh my gosh. Well, is that like a question? Um, I mean, I would say go to all of them because they're all different and different girls go. Um, but if you really want like a good experience, you want the best time AVN Mm -hmm. because like Exotica and all that stuff is really cool. But, um, girls are really tired because they're not there to like they're there to meet fans for the day and then there to go to bed and they've traveled there, right? Mm-hmm. Like Exotica girls are there to meet fans, but also dress up and go to after parties. And even though it's tiring, we're still having fun. It's a little bit more fun than Exotica's. Um, and you can co-mingle with them more. Like you see a girl walking around the hotel, like, and you can talk to her versus Exotica's like convention and that's it. Mm-hmm. So. so you're talking about ABN versus Exotica. Yeah, yeah. I think ABN's like the best one. You're like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, one year, thank God I have like the best fans. Uh, one year I drank so much I blacked out and I guess I started crying because I couldn't find my room. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I can't find my room. And I had a really nice fan who like delivered me to my room. He helped He helped me uh, find my key and then delivering me to my room and was just really nice. Like, that's it. And then the, the next day at the convention, I saw him and he was like, remember I helped you? And I was like, you did. Thank you so much. Like, and then he uh, brought me flowers. So like the cool thing, I think in that convention, or AVN, you kind of have a little more um, just regular moments with them. Mm-hmm. You know, like the lines in the convention might suck, you know, mm-hmm. but you have the opportunity to see them outside. And then you get to celebrate the wins and the fun parts. Like, yeah. If I was there celebrating a award show, like the best thing is like when I win, fans are like, Adriana, you yeah. know, and they're like, let me get a picture of you with your award. And I'm like, fuck yeah, you know. How did it feel when you finally won that AVN award? I mean, you've been nominated for Performer of the Year so many times and mm. then you you finally won it. Like yeah. how, what was that moment like? Um, sometimes I cry uh, talking about it, but um, it was like, it was the one of the most validating moments of my life because I not only um, got recognized, but I was validated by my peers uh, mm-hmm. because I won't say the validation came from 
everyone that stood up because you don't often see everyone stand up when a performer wins. Everyone stood up when I won and that was like the coolest thing. And I, I had my cell phone. Uh, my friend was filming it and uh, I watched the video afterwards and there were so many people around that was like, finally. And I could see their lips being like, yeah. Yeah. So that was just one of the best feelings because I was validated for my hard work and um, to be celebrated for pushing yourself and, and you know, doing extreme things is is awesome. It's like yeah. the best thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's still to this day is like one of the best things. That's why I'm like, I could never regret anything I've done because it makes me feel so happy. Yeah. Yeah. But you, I mean, it seems like you've grown as a person and you have, you've done everything you've done, like you said, and you have other goals and you have, seem to have very clear cut goals in yeah. mind of like what you're going to do next. Cause so often you hear like, I don't know what I would do outside of porn or like what happens to these girls after porn? Like what totally. do they do? They just vanish into the ether. But like, you've created this, you've created this brand, you have this name and you seem to really like want to take it somewhere and, and do something with it. Totally. That totally. feels really meaningful to you. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I'm so blessed. Like, to be honest, like if I wanted to sit and do nothing for 10 years, I could still achieve a great income mm -hmm. just because of how hard I work. So I'm like, you know, even, even like new girls getting in, like if, if you get into porn, like remember that this is a brand it's not just you and you could live off this brand and you can use it and do great things with it. Like even, even doing porn and showing other people to be comfortable with their body or the type of scenes is, mm -hmm. is amazing. But the power that, that creating a brand or something like this has is yeah. wild. It's like so amazing and so blessed for it. Yeah. Do you see anyone who's transitioned out of porn that you look at and think like, that's kind of the trajectory that I want to follow? Um, so I really, I, I mean, she's had some negative things, said some negative things. So in that, that takeaway, no, but I think Mia, Mia Khalifa, mm -hmm. um, I want to be more of a, a voice, but mm -hmm. Mia Khalifa, I think is somebody that's done such a good job at transitioning into like mainstream fashion, fashion icon. Mm -hmm. Um, and then everyone laughs when I say this, but like, there's truth, Kim Kardashian, like Kim Kardashian is an amazing staying power. She's a businesswoman. Um, she has brands, but ultimately she's an amazing businesswoman. And I think what she's done with her career is just amazing because you can still watch her porno. Yeah. So, you know? Yeah, that's true. Like, it's it's amazing. She's done some awesome stuff. And then, um, you know, other than that, like, I would say Mia too. But I don't really think there's any girls out there that's gone into this avenue because I don't – I don't want to, I don't want to be famous or people are always like, why don't you act? I don't want to act, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to be a celebrity. I want to, I want to be, you know, uh, an activist, uh, some, uh, uh, a passion, somebody that changes other people's passions or helps them with their passions. I mean, mm -hmm. so that's I want to be a Tony Robbins, you know, like it. that's the goal <laughs> is to be like a, a, a sex working Tony Robbins and like, even just, even just like helping girls. I often help girls now that are important with advice and, you know, I'd be great to one day just be able to help women who are getting into sex work, you know, develop their brand. Because there's, if you look in porn, there's a huge hole for that. Mm -hmm. Like you can get in, okay, hire a porn PR person, but to hire somebody to like, I want to get into sex work and I want to build this brand. How do I do it? Mm -hmm. There's no, there's, you have to figure it out on your own. There's yeah. no, there's no like clear cut. This There's is no the guide. best advice. Yeah. So that would be really cool as well. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. We've, Adriana, this has been amazing. You're like, <laughs> I mean, you. I always knew you were an amazing person, but I never got the opportunity to sit down with you. And like, I'm like so fucking impressed by you right Thank now. Thank you. And like your Thank growth you so and like your self-awareness and it's just like, it's just really inspiring. Thank you. So thank you for having me on. Thank you, thank for, you being for asking you. me good questions too. <laughs> I love welcome. that. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, I mean, you know, I try to like always get to the person behind, you know, the porn persona mm -hmm. and not everybody necessarily wants to reveal that, but you seem to be in a place where like, you really like want to be authentic to who you really are. And like, you're in that self-discovery mode. And that's always a really scary, but exciting place to be. And it's really cool to watch other people go through that because yeah. I think we all are trying to find like our authentic self and totally. try to find our place in this world. And so when you see other people being open about that and then being able to achieve that, I just feel like that's just, it's something that we all love to see. Yeah. So 
Thank you. So thank, thank you for having you. me on. Thank you. It was a blast. <laughs> um, can you tell, if they don't know already, everyone uh, where to find you on social media? Yes. So you can find me on Twitter, Adriana Chechik. Um, I'm big on Twitch. So Adriana Chechik underscore. Um, Instagram, bratnasty69. And yeah, that's it. Fantastic. So. <laughs> and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch these videos being streamed live, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week.